Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. Um, this is Matan Berry from uh, AgPollution and from the IDA YLP. The International Desalination Association is the leading global organization dedicated to desalination and water reuse with about 2,600 core members from about 60 countries. And our uh, Young Leaders program is open to IDA members age 35 years or under and is dedicated to advance careers, promote opportunities and interest in desalination around the world. It provides young leaders with a platform to network, connect, and extend their professional knowledge in desalination worldwide. And one of our initiatives is our quarterly webinar series, which you are watching right now. Um, the webinar aims to involve YLP members in desalination discussions, as well as showcase new technologies and careers in desalination. Um, this time, the topic will be more university-oriented, dealing with leading-edge research in desalination and water reuse. We are very happy to welcome Isabel Escobar to give today's presentation. Isabel is a professor in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at the University of Toledo, Ohio. Dr. Escobar's research focuses on developing and improving polymeric membrane materials for water treatment. And among her current projects is work on nano-enhanced flow fouling membranes, um, biofouling mechanisms, and biomimetic membranes. Isabel Escobar earned her PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Central Florida. She's highly awarded, including the 2009 Northwest Ohio YWCA Milestone Award for Education, University of Toledo College of Engineering Outstanding Teacher Award, and the Toledo 20 other order under 40 Leadership Award. She has written over 50 manuscripts, has edited two books, has one patent, and has given over 100 presentations at national and international member separations. In 2013, she was chosen to become the editor-in-chief of the International Desalination Association Journal Desalination and Water Reuse, and she was just recently elected uh, to head the North American Member Society. Um, before handing over to Isabel, I would like to remind our live viewers that you can ask questions by watching this live broadcast on the YouTube page and basically just typing your questions in the box used for comments below the video. With that said, um, Isabel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Matan. That was a very kind introduction. Is the kind that uh, makes me want to say, well, I'm done. Uh, that introduction was very nice. Thank you. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be talking uh, to the uh, uh, YP group. I, it's, I hope that uh, I get to talk a little bit about things that uh, will be of interest. I welcome questions. Uh, I very much like an interactive uh, format as well. I love questions. So please, and even post, feel free to email me uh, if you have questions. and. Hopefully I'll share my presentation and everything looks good and I can start talking about uh, some of uh, the things that I see us going into as uh, we talk about leading edge research in desalination. I know that uh, in the uh, uh, description it also talked about water reuse, but with 30 minutes I thought uh, to limit to desalination a little bit more. I am going to be focusing mostly on membranes and I always like to start my talks and presentations like this with giving this quote. I think that uh, this is one of the quotes that uh, defines what we do in the world of desalination, in the world of uh, water reuse and water treatment. And about back in 1962, President John F. Kennedy said that um, if there was a way to produce fresh water from salt water at a low cost, it would dwarf any other scientific accomplishment. And this is the man that uh, took that made people be able to go to the moon and had the dream about going to the moon and still this is brought up that uh, what we do with desalination is at that level of focus. So just for a short background I'm going to only spend a couple of minutes uh, going over some of the past just in case there's anybody here who's young and or anybody here who just thought that this could be something interesting to get a little bit of a new background on this and as things go on for posterity once we have things on the internet they're now there forever. I always like to talk a little bit, uh, tie 
that that statement from the 1960s with the global water scarcity and with the fact that uh, we're now getting very close to that 2025 mark when we might just be with a very large portion of the earth in water scarce regions so looking more and more into desalination in water reuse and right now looking at the global capacity of where the plants are, the vast majority of what's happening with seawater desalination is in the Gulf in the Gulf countries, is happening in the Middle East. That's obviously self um, evidence. There is a reason for that. There's very little water. I have several projects uh, with Middle Eastern countries uh, because of that reason. There's very little water uh, available. When you look at North America, we are looking a lot more into brackish water. Uh, there's a lot of brackish water, uh, especially groundwater in the United States. And then, uh, unfortunately, we still are very small numbers, very small percentages for the wastewater reuse, but hopefully these will go up with time. And some of the reasons that I remember I said that I was going to focus a little bit more on membranes is really this, and I think you can see my mouse. So um, I like to point out that until not that long ago, uh, the cost for the distillation, the cost for the thermal processes was still a little cheaper than the cost for membranes, but uh, now membranes are actually uh, becoming more uh, cost effective than the thermal treatment processes in here. This is just an example. I uh, in all my slides I'm showing the references of where this information is coming from. Uh, but for reverse osmosis desalination it is now at about 46 cents per cubic meter of water and this is US dollars which is still very close to distillation but it's now um, on the decrease in membranes. Uh, I do I do research in membranes uh, more than any other form of desalination, mainly because their cost is decreasing. I work a lot on the materials and looking at the costs continuing decrease to decrease. And then there's also the, the upscale. Um, membranes are very easy to continue to upscale, and as population grows, uh, a plant can continuously to be uh, increased in size. Uh, this slide, I thought it's a great uh, description of where we have been in talking about uh, where membranes back in 1978 salt passage for a membrane was at that 1.4 percent if we look at uh, the graph in the top left and by 2008 it was already at approximately 0.2 percent. Uh, 1.4 percent salt passage would not allow uh, for desalted water to meet regulations but that has been on the decrease. Um, the cost like I just showed now, it's also been on a significant decrease and the energy consumption, which goes along very well with the cost, has also been on a significant decrease. And these have all led to where membranes are actually now competitive and competitive to a point that there are a number of installations of membranes. And I do have to say that all of these improvements have come from both academia, but also very strongly a lot of the improvements on membranes have come from industry. Uh, industrial membranes back in the 70s were at these low values and uh, just commercial membranes, I'm not going to go through commercial membranes available now, but commercial membranes are really able to get uh, to very minimal salt passages, um, very efficient, efficient energy consumption and continuously decreasing the cost. So this really is a technology that we look at the entire life of this technology in 30 years as the slideshow, we have gone from something that really was not useful to something that uh, is installed all over the world, which is quite remarkable, thinking that in the world of water treatment, um, the pharaohs invented alum and we still use alum. Uh, so it's a several thousand year old technology that we're still using and here comes membranes, this very young technology in the grand scheme of things and it is very widely used, sort of similar to computers but I'm biased for membranes and desalination and uh, a little bit more 
on this idea of cost and installations. I love this graph, uh, these two graphs, because the top one shows that uh, the number of install uh, of installations is going up as the price is decreasing, and then the bottom slide just shows how, especially, the cost of desalination has decreased to uh, to just an incredible by an incredible amount in a very short period of time in a span of 20 years there's a pretty significant substantial decrease in the cost and this is exciting uh, it obviously has a lot of motivations for this cost uh, we have limited water supply uh, but a lot of this is coming from these reverse osmosis advances and membrane advances as well uh, innovations in process a lot of hybridization wastewater <coughs> excuse me wastewater reuse better pretreatment all of the things that um, a couple of decades ago were identified as issues that were limiting membranes they are now really what led to all of these decreases in cost but there are still issues with membranes and um, from an academic standpoint from very much from being a professor I do have to say that uh, these are our bread and butter um, if there are issues with membranes and if there are still issues with the plants there's reason for us to continue doing research and um, so um, I do from from one standpoint do cherish these uh, a little bit obviously uh, I do want membranes, though, to be the best and to be um, uh, desalting waters everywhere. But of this one, these are just factors um, that have led to performance decline in membranes. Um, membrane degradation is a big one, but if we look at it as a group, membrane fouling has really been a key issue, and membrane biofouling within that takes quite a large of the percentage of the reason for um, performance decline. And some of the factors that um, it's still looking at this, this is from another standpoint, this is looking at another group of membranes and just seeing uh, the same maybe in a little bit different format, we see that membrane fouling is really about uh, three quarters of uh, the um, the decline and then again biofouling is a significant portion of that and looking at how a membrane operates if uh, we provide minimal pretreatment uh, there would be issues with both uh, cake formation the absorption of materials on the surface that will lead to a gel that will lead to a cake formation um, that would lead to organic matter fouling there is scaling that comes just from the salt precipitation but Biofouling is really one of the key issues and is often called um, the membrane cancer because once it starts to grow, it continues to grow. And in affecting fouling, obviously we wish uh, one of the things that a, a lot of people do research is in trying to determine and predict fouling. So um, is it a pore size, is it a size distribution, is it a hydrophobicity? charge, roughness, and then there are the phalans themselves that you have the perfect membrane, the perfect hydrophilicity, excellent charge and everything by the book is said to be perfect, and then phalans are different and now you have different interaction and everything does not work. Um, the hydrodynamics, there's a lot of work on the feed spacers, um, hollow fibers versus spider wound and then there's the solution chemistry itself with pH, ionic strength, so so many factors play into fouling that um, hopefully we'll continue to have enough research going into this for a, a lot of time to come and now we're finally going to start getting closer to the meat of my presentation <coughs> excuse me and I just like to start with looking up some of the traditional polymers for reverse osmosis and nanofiltration. Um, a lot, the most traditional one, the oldest one, the first one was the cellulose acetate. We now look uh, are a lot in the world of polyamides, uh, a lot of, of film, film composites. We use polysomophones very often uh, for the support of the membrane, for that porous support. So I do like, because I'm going, I am not going to be talking a lot on chemistry, so I will say uh, to myself, 
for that, I always say darn, but to my audience, I always say you're welcome. Uh, because I can really get into the chemistry and then everyone would just, I would be the only person having fun on this call. But let me talk a little bit about um, the work that it's being done in looking at membranes in different ways. And one, a, a lot of work is happening on functionalized membrane surfaces. So now you take a membrane and you either take the surface or you take the pore surface and you functionalize that uh, for these specific applications that you want. There is a lot of work nowadays. There are researchers at the University of Kentucky and other universities that can actually, uh, on membrane surface pores, um, make nanoparticles. So they can functionalize nanoparticles by interacting. Once they filter the nanoparticles through the membranes, they can functionalize nanoparticles to look the way that they want them to look. Or um, to the pores, there can, uh, nanoparticles can be added to the pores, enzymes can be added to the pores, charge, hydrophobicity, uh, a number of groups can be added to the pores, and the beauty of this being done this way is that changes could happen in the pore. So this may be not so much for desalination since we're more worried about a removal and desalination, but in, for a system that uh, you want um, the, the permeate to have different characteristics from the feed water, this kind of membrane could be used. This kind of membrane with the functionalized pores can change characteristics of the permeate. Or um, the addition of nanoparticles can quite often has been used for to prevent um, biofouling. So some biofouling in the pores. Looking at another, and I'm just going to be throwing a lot of uh, interesting places that we are going with research, and I'm going to give you a little bit also, little shots of what my group does, uh, so it should entice you a little bit uh, about how cool these things can be, and uh, it, these, it does excite me a lot, so if I start to sound really excited, it's because I really am. Um, Stimulant responsive polymers. Right now, there's a lot of research in my group, and so to this one, I'm going to show you a little bit of our data, is making the membrane itself not a stagnant membrane. Remember when I was talking about the factors affecting that uh, the membrane characteristics effective fouling, that uh, the water characteristics effective fouling? Well, if we now make a membrane that the membrane characteristic can change, as a function of a stimulus, we could actually be making to where a membrane is now a dynamic surface and is continuously changing its properties. So very commonly used stimuli are pH, temperature, light, and ionic strength. So just by switching those, you can have, just by increasing and decreasing the pH or temperature, you can have the membrane change from being more hydrophobic to becoming more hydrophilic or vice versa. It can make surfaces rougher or smoother. It can make surface more reactive. It can provide a uh, quite a significant number of responses that uh, make the membrane an active dynamic membrane. And I know this is an incredibly busy slide, and I don't and I'm not going to go through every single part of it, but this is just our work on uh, anisopropyl acrylamide on stimulant responsive membranes using nanofiltration membranes. We make them responsive to temperature. And what I want you to look at, if the mouse does show, are just these SCMs here on the side. That first I have the clean membrane. This is the clean regular, as regular cellulose acetate membrane. We like cellulose acetate because it's just really easy to activate. Next to it, has one of the membranes that we have developed with this activation. And then when we take just uh, the, the regular membrane and we foul it with proteins, it looks more fouled than our modified membrane, but it's still fairly similar. It is when we put it in contact with humic acids that we see a significant amount of fouling on that regular uh, modified membrane. And that stimulant responsive membrane shows a very minimal amount of fouling here. And what we see is that uh, when we have the temperature going up and down, we can maintain a flux a lot 
more a, a, a flux that's a lot more constant and decry, declines less over a period of time thanks to that stimulus. This is we're still determining the ideal switching period of when we switch the temperature up and down and we're looking at um, different fields like RF fields to cause the switch so that that would not be a significant cost. On another interesting way of uh, now looking at modifying membranes, now first thing that you see, the first reference to this comes from, from 1992. When we were talking about the fact that 1995 the cost of membranes was not really something that could be used uh, to where we are now, you know that there are a lot of advancements that happen. But this technique was discovered then and it essentially just takes a charged surface and puts in contact several different layers of, uh, of assembly, layers of materials that will attach to the surface and as you want to clean the membrane, as this, as the outer layer becomes foul, you just put it in contact with a solution that makes this layer be completely removed or this layer gets completely removed and then you can contact again the membrane with these different layers by just filtering but this is a common way of looking at least now I know that you immediately are thinking there are a lot of issues with the upscale of that but looking at this at a laboratory scale it is something that it is working and this is just a little bit more on that that uh, you can take a membrane you can take a substrate and you can just dip in different solutions and just call and just form a number of layers going up from the membrane and when it gets time to clean again you can simply contact with um, with a cleaning agent that would remove one of the layers so there's a lot of work going on in this um, some of the exciting things that people are now talking a lot more about is graphene we've been hearing a lot of the potential of using graphene and one of the perfect things of uh, graphene is that it has that idea of a perfect pour it could it has the potential to lead to a perfect pour and notice that I am not talking about costs uh, the cost of a graphene membrane would be pretty significant but we have to start doing the research in order to determine if it would work even a graphene uh, a graphene membrane, sorry, I moved a little uh, too fast, but where we are right now, graphene membranes, they can be very easily damaged and they may not survive operations as they are, as they currently exist. What does that do for those of us in research? It opens a lot of doors, a lot of ideas. There are a lot of people exchanging ideas at KAUST, at a number of other universities, about how to make graphene membranes work uh, both in a way that they would be inexpensive and wouldn't be so easily damaged. There's already a lot of work showing that uh, they could be excellent for gas operations but not yet so much for water and especially for desalination because of this issue of being damaged. Carbon nanotubes, that's another one that uh, we have heard a lot about. There has been a lot of work on carbon nanotubes for membranes. Um, carbon nanotubes are somewhat perfect for uh, gas separations, uh, but will they work well uh, with water? Can they transport water well? And one of um, and so far, there's a lot of uh, work that has shown that yes, they can or no, they cannot. There's a lot of competing work showing that. Uh, uh, that the carbon nanotubes, because of the level of hydrophobicity that they have, they interact a lot with biofoulins, a lot with the organisms, so as to increase biofouling. And then there's a lot of work out there that shows the opposite, that shows that actually they prevent uh, biofouling and they have work and they work very well for that. And one of the things that the carbon nanotubes can do is provide a very functional uh, pore that can be. Um, designed uh, the way that um, the activity wants or that the researcher wants. But some of the issues with carbon nanotubes is the fabrication. 
um, carbon nanotubes for the for this idea of them being ideal uh, of them being used as spores. They really have to be lined up. They have to be lined up correctly, and then um, you see the word spin coating, which is something a lot more at a laboratory bent scale. But the potential is there. Uh, the potential for maybe looking at not aligning the carbon nanotubes and uh, making them in different ways that uh, could make them, could make the carbon nanotube membranes perfect for uh, something like desalination because of the size of the nanotubes. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about is the biomimetic and bioinspired membranes. And um, I'm also going to show some of the work that we are doing in biomimetics. And I have to say that uh, biomimetics, I like to, I'm finishing with this one because it is probably one of the most exciting possibilities out there. And uh, it's really quite limitless. Uh, if we first look at the picture that is on the right of that muscle, and polydopamine, uh, we know that mussels and water treatment plants are enemies, or they're strong enemies. Uh, we have a lot of problems. I'm just uh, in the Great Lakes here in the United States, just on Lake Erie. And mussels, they can clog pumps, they can clog pipes, they'll bind to things and they'll just stay bound. And um, it was identified a few years ago on uh, th that it was dopamine that uh, caused the stickiness. And some researchers at the University of Texas at Austin started using that to make membranes. And once the, mem once the polydopamine sticks to a surface, it becomes incredibly hydrophilic and uh, emulating that ability that uh, the muscle has to contact with water. So they're incredibly exciting, and these are essentially super hydrophilic membranes, uh, with uh, and they're bio-inspired with a lot of possibilities. There's also the biomimetics that is trying to use aquaporins or other form of transport channels that uh, reflect what happens in actual living cells and um, usually you, you cannot see me but my hands are moving up and down and I'm showing flow channels and I'm pointing to my hands um, because biomimetics always I like to point out that as the human body we're essentially 100 uh, percent efficient if we were not we would be very dead very quickly and that's what we're trying to make in membranes some of the work that my group does we take polybenzimidazole as a basis for the membrane and then we modify that and this is very difficult to see because it's a very preliminary data that I'm showing to you as preliminary as my student just gave it to me not that long ago and one of the things that uh, we were able to achieve when we use aquaporins in a new form of making the membrane is an ability to cover the flux and I, I understand that these are protein rejections and not salt water we will have those underway shortly but we obtain flux recovery of nearly 100 percent as opposed to the regular membrane that uh, has a flux recovery of 69 percent and that's just when contacting with just pure distilled water so this is a very reversible flux and we see a much lower flux decline during operation. And then just to finish, I'm getting close to my last slide, just showing to you a little bit more of what my group does. Um, we work a lot with layer by layer type of activation of surfaces of uh, polybenzimidazoles uh, in both flesh sheet as well as hollow fibers. And we increase, we give them more hydrophilicity, we give them charge. Uh, we functionalize them. When there are pores, we functionalize the pores. We make a lot of antimicrobial surfaces by charging membranes and charging feed spacers with copper and by chelating them in a way that they are not uh, separated, that they're that to separate them from other surfaces is very difficult. And we see significant decreases from an unmodified biofouling to a modified surface biofouling. And we also do that to membranes as well, where we see significantly less amount of uh, biofouling happening on surfaces. And we make these pretty little blue 
membranes um, to that extent. And with that, I do like to say that um, what, I've sh what I'm showing to you, it's all very much right here, very much on your left-hand side. It's at the lab scale. We make small membranes. When I talk about a large piece of membrane, I'm talking about something that's about five centimeters. Uh, from that, all that I've shown to you, all of these new membranes, we have to look at how to take them to a large-scale production to then be able to make a spiral wound module uh, for those membranes. So a lot of these, these are possibilities. This is what researchers are looking at now for hopefully future membranes, but not too far in the future. I, as I'm getting close to the end, I'm just going to stay here because we're running out of time for just about one minute. But in one of the books that I edited, uh, a survey was done in Australia of about 1,500 people, and it was found that people still do not feel comfortable drinking desalted water. This is let's not even talk about recycled water. There's a yuck factor in the recycled water, but people don't feel comfortable with drinking or bathing their babies in desalted water, which is a significant issue, which is work for us. Uh, in the desalination community to educate the public about how safe the salted water is and how much safer it is than many of the other waters. People are going to be using this very pure, very expensive water to flush their toilets instead of drinking. Uh, but let's end on a positive note. The total capacity uh, is increasing the install capacity of desalination in general and much of that being uh, membrane mean reverse osmosis desalination is on a fast increase worldwide and even as they're maturing we still have a lot of innovations um, we still need to make to where fouling is not going to happen as commonly as it is plants are not going to fail as much. We need to reduce the cost. We need to make them more reliable and there are environmental impacts. And to that I do want to add that we also need to make, uh, need to inform the public, need to educate the public about the water that we produce through desalination. Making a plug for the journal. Uh, please, if you have work, submit to the journal. Um, we revamped the journal last year. It is a fantastic source for what is happening for the latest in desalination and in water reuse, and we would love to see your papers, and we would love to see you reading the journal as well. And uh, I want to acknowledge my funding sources. Much of my work has come from the National Science Foundation and from the Department of Interior uh, the, here in the United States. Uh, if you have, if you want more information about what we do to see some of our publications, you can go to our website. And with this, I'll stop sharing the screen so that uh, you can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. This was a very interesting presentation, and uh, I'd like to welcome our viewers to post their questions, and uh, you can do that right now and um, until we get a couple of questions in a couple of questions in I, I have a few questions on my of my own um, you presented some of the very hot topics in desalination or membrane desalination uh, research uh, that's that have been going on the past couple of years um, we've seen surface modification um, carbon nanotubes graphene um, nanoparticles um, biomimetics um, what technology or what um, direction out of these research topics do you see the closest to industrial application? So um, if you had to rate them according to technology readiness level, as um, one usually does, uh, uh, which, which one do you think is the most promising? That is an excellent question. Um, all of them have pluses and minuses. Um, I know that, uh, uh, for one, biomimetics, there are companies that are making biomimetic membranes. There's still some issues with costs, so maybe some form of biomimetics. Um, also, the bio-inspired, the ones using the polydopamine, I believe that they're actually already looking at industrial-level membranes, and again, the, the aquaporins uh, are also being used or 
being used at an in, more industrial level. I would say that the least ready right now might be graphene. Um, there are a lot of issues, the brittleness, the easy to damage, uh, but there's a lot of potential uh, for those. And the others, it's, it's a lot about um, making them, um, reducing the costs. Uh, the carbon nanotubes, there's an issue with making of the membranes and then um, potentially the, the ones with the stimuli, it's the stimulus that uh, we need to figure out how to make those cheap. Okay. And what do you think could be done in order to increase or improve technology transfer between uh, universities and um, industry? You know, uh, that is one of the things that I would love to see happen more and more. Uh, sometimes it seems like academics were going in this crazy off the side, off the wall, looking at cost doesn't matter. Cost doesn't matter to us. Let's yeah. make something. Let's buy something really expensive that it's really hard to make, and we'll just make it. And then, uh, obviously, ind industry is looking at very similar, but with cost in mind. With let's find something. Let's make something in a way that can actually be used. And I think we need to see uh, at conferences more industry academic um, sessions that gets people talking, and not only. A uh, set of people come in and say, well, this is what we do, try to figure out how to use what we do, but showing joint projects, how the people get to work together. I think that uh, it would be incredibly exciting to work more back and forth uh, with industry because it's uh, for, for academics, like I said, we can go off the deep end and uh, just really go into these crazy ideas and uh, to just have the back and forth and to have the exchange of knowledge would be fantastic. Right. Okay. Um, we do have one question uh, from a viewer um, asking, um, how do you plan to further develop the feed spacer modification work? Uh, so our feed spacer, uh, we did a lot with the feed spacer and unfortunately we ran out of the funding for that one and that's a problem with academic research. We have funding to do something and that uh, would be a great way to interact with industry is to, con to look at the continuing funding. Uh, for the feed spacers we got it to where the cleaning only needed to come after 13 days, any level of cleaning, as just as in a backwash, uh, we got after 13 days with the modified feed, spur, feed spacer versus 48 hours with the unmodified one. So we had a great deal of, uh, we, we got great deal of excellent results, uh, but it was the scale up. That would be the next step. Right. And if we're already on the topic of funding, um, maybe you can give some recommendations uh, on how to get funded uh, if you want to do um, academic uh, desalination research. Yeah, funding. That's probably the, the part that us all hate the most. Um, it, the, the first thing that I would have to say if there's anybody considering uh, going into academia, um, don't, it's the don't, do not be discouraged. We get bad reviews once in a while. Um, when we get bad reviews, we get mad and we scream at them. But the problem is when we get excellent reviews, which I got them not that long ago, excellent reviews. Everybody's saying, this is great, this is wonderful, we just don't have money to fund you. And that just makes, that that's the one, it's the difficult one. It's finding different sources. Is uh, so the main one. There are the big famous sources throughout the world. There are the big competitions that provide a lot of money, but the ones that are quite often overlooked are the small pots of money. There are a lot of uh, throughout the world, a lot of foundation kind of uh, funds that can be used. Partnering, uh, I think academics don't partner enough uh, with industry or with plants. So more partnerships uh, to look at problems that would be an excellent source of funding. Right. And uh, I know there are at least a few grads uh, um, and uh, they're probably considering maybe pursuing an academic career in desalination. Um, what would you say are the necessary steps in uh, succeeding uh, in pursuing such a career? 
Um, like would you say you, you have to go to the industry, you don't have to go to the industry, um, go international? I think it's so much it depends on what you love to do. Um, I think all possible routes are, are, are excellent. Uh, if you go the academic route, uh, we quite often, the way that we do things, we, we look, we, we teach. So you have to enjoy, enjoy teaching. If you're going the academic route, teaching is a portion of what we do. I've taught a number of membrane classes, but I've also taught a lot of non-membrane classes. Like right now, I'm teaching 100 freshmen, 100 first-year college students. So, right. you know, you have to teach as well. But doing research, doing research with graduate students, publishing the research, it's incredibly rewarding. It's it's a wonderful passion of mine. I, love see them grow into the research and learn what they're doing and become better than I am and then explain to me what they're doing so that I can follow. I love that. So I think that it's it's a love. Uh, for industry, I think you have to love the idea that um, a lot of what you do will come uh, to be used. You will actually see what you are doing, what you are producing, your thoughts, your inventions be used by the public be used to solve the problem so I think that that is incredibly exciting uh, and it's for somebody who wants that and then there, there's also the route of uh, research laboratories in the United States we have a lot of uh, government research laboratories and in those you really are you yourself in the lab doing the research uh, that's one of the things that I do miss I'm no longer in the lab, and when I get to the lab these days, my students say, don't touch things, I'll, I'll take care of it. So uh, I think that they're all very exciting. It's all about based on people, on what people love. Excellent. And maybe just uh, one last question. I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, membrane desalination, uh, and there's a lot of work going there. Um, do you know current interesting topics going on research uh, about thermal desalination? I think the main thing with thermal desalination and my knowledge on that one is a lot more limited but it has a lot to do with the cost. Uh, the cost and how to expand uh, the plants. The, when we're talking about thermal desalination we're talking quite often these large columns, the large equipment that uh, is a one size. So how to expand size and how to make things more cost effective with the, the thermal needs. And I know that there's a lot of research looking at how to not use as much energy for them. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Isabel, for this uh, great talk. I had a great time listening. I hope the, the viewers as well. Thank you very and, much. Uh, I'm wishing you all the best with your research and teaching and career. And uh, I'd also like to say thank you for to our uh, director and producer backstage, Mike Dixon. And uh, we hope to see you all in the next webinar. Take care.